Hello and welcome to the NCBI Now workshop, Mapping and Variant Calling from DNA Sequence Data. My name is Jonathan Pevsner. I'm at the Kennedy Krieger Institute in Baltimore. While I'm not at NCBI, I'm a user of NCBI tools, and it's really exciting to present this workshop. We're going to ask the basic question, when you get DNA sequence data from the human genome, how do you find variation in it? How do you study it using the tools of next generation sequencing? Here's an outline of what I'd like to present. This is split into two separate presentations. First, I'd like to give you some background and motivation and say why we're doing this. And then I'd like to talk about which computer you'll use, what operating system, and how to organize your directories. I'm assuming that you don't have experience in working with next generation sequence data before, so a lot of what we have to go over involves how to do computational work. Then I'll introduce two workflows. One that's simplest is a brand new tool from NCBI that allows us to use the popular Genome Analysis Toolkit, or GATK, natively, and that means basically we have one command that will let us look at variation in the human genome and output a really useful file that describes and summarizes that variation. A second workflow is more complicated, but is also mainstream in terms of what people working in this type of data analysis uh, arena have to do. I'll show you how to download, compile, and install various software tools, and we'll take a look at how to find sequence data of interest at the NCBI website. All of this forms a kind of a background. Then, um, at, towards the end of this presentation, we'll do workflow one, which is the straightforward one of starting with a sequence read archive, or SRA, tool that allows you to take aligned DNA sequence reads and call variants in them very quickly and easily. In our next presentation, we'll look at the second work workflow, which takes us through the basic file types of next generation sequence analysis, starting with here's step seven, getting raw data in a format called FASTQ that I'll define, assessing the quality of those data, finding and indexing a reference genome, and then mapping the reads, manipulating the data, and calling variants. We'll end by visualizing the data, both with the Integrative Genomics Viewer, IGV, and with NCBI's tool, Genome Workbench, we'll analyze our, gen our genomic variants. So that's the big picture. I'll start then with the background and motivation. I would like to tell you that I've prepared a document, and this document is an HTML file that you have as part of the workshop materials. So you can follow along on the HTML document. You can also take notes that way, and when there are particular commands, you'll be able to copy and paste them and follow along. Let's begin then with the background and motivation. Let's take a look at a few slides that discuss this revolution in next generation sequence technology and what that means for biology. The Illumina platform is one of the major platforms for next generation sequencing. In it, we can take genomic DNA, prepare samples, grow clusters on a solid surface, and perform sequencing in a massively parallel fashion. What this means is that following image acquisition, we can get DNA reads, that's the base calling. A read may have a length, for example, of 100 bases, or more, maybe 200 bases. And the read is something which is a basic unit that's acquired by this technology. The reads add up to letting you sequence a whole genome, and this slide from NHGRI at NIH shows that the sequence cost has been declining dramatically over years. This is the year on the x-axis and the number of dollars it costs to, sequ to sequence a genome or the cost per megabase on the y-axis. And this has been declining rapidly since next generation sequencing was introduced around 2008 and the years following. What this means in terms of the amount of data that we can acquire is that, again, looking at year here, from 1985 to 2000 and on to the present, the amount of DNA sequence available in GenBank, a major repository of DNA, has increased steadily the y-axis shows a log 10 uh, scale, and so we go from a million bases to 100 million to a billion bases of DNA in the database, and this is something that at the time seemed incredibly dramatic, but we see that the whole genome sequence bases in a separate repository at NIH also have a comparable amount of sequence, and then as next generation sequencing emerges, we have the Sequence Read Archive, or SRA, having both total bases shown in red and the open access bases, those that don't have protected health information or aren't controlled access, shown in purple. 
And the little green bar at top tells us that just in the year 2014 alone, there probably were about 40 times 10 to the 15th bases of DNA sequenced across the world in major genome sequencing centers. So this is the mass influx of sequence data, which is transforming many different areas of biology. Once these sequence reads come in, the main idea is that you have a string of GATC, and for every single base that's acquired, here shown in the trace archive at NCBI, there's an associated quality score. We happen to be looking at the beta glo globin locus, and for every single nucleotide that's called, even if you call billions of nucleotides in one experiment, you'll have an equal number of quality scores that tell you how much to trust each particular base call. That turns out to be very valuable as we're moving forward. So this is an example of low quality reads in which the base quality is very low and it's hard to distinguish between GATC. When you have high quality reads with high quality scores, you can see the red, black, blue, and green peaks very easily to call the appropriate nucleotides of that read. Now, what is a read? It's something that might extend for 100 base pairs or 200 base pairs. It's something that consists of the language of GATC, and it may be mapped to a reference genome. So this particular plot shows a reference genome along the bottom, and that means a canonical agreed upon snapshot or version of what a genome looks like, whether it's human or another organism. This is the culmination of making a genome build, and we'll look at several of them in this workshop. You can also see a variant appearing as a single position in the reference might have a C, but there's a number of calls of a T. In this case, there might be a read depth of about 15 independent answers as to what the nucleotide call is at a given position. And if the call disagrees with the reference, we say we have a variant. This is the kind of thing we're looking for as we look into a genome. Another example of looking for a variant, the reference is shown vertically in this particular case. The read depth is shown next, and it happens to be around 25 to 30 in this experiment. The dot and the comma indicates a read that has agreement with the reference, either on the top strand or the bottom strand. And we have a position here where there is a reference of A, but there are 29 G calls. And so this was clearly a disagreement or a variant that differs from the reference. For those studying more subtle things, such as somatic variation, we might expect an occasional T residue to be actually a somatic mutation, something that might need to be distinguished from the background error rate of a sequencing read. When we do human genome sequencing for research or clinical work, we typically get whole genome sequence coverage of 30 to 50x depth, and that means at every position across the genome there's an average of that many reads covering that position. So for one typical individual, we might sequence roughly 2.8 billion base pairs of DNA. Um, some of the genome is not easily sequenceable because it's highly repetitive. From a typical person, we see three or four million single nucleotide variants, perhaps 600,000 indels or insertion deletion events where a chunk of DNA is deleted or duplicated. The cost typically now is under $2,000 per genome. For some users, it's approaching $1,000 per genome. And in general, in research, many of us try to sequence mother, father, child trios. There's so much variation that it helps to interpret what's happening in a child by comparison to the reference and the um, variant reads that are present in the parents. Whole genome sequencing is very prominent, and in this workshop we'll understand how to do that kind of analysis. It's complemented by whole exome sequencing, in which we enrich the collection of exons and perform whole exome sequencing. For a typical individual, that means we're sequencing about 60 million base pairs rather than 2.8 billion. There are typically about 80,000 variants and often on the order of 11,000 non-synonymous single nucleotide polymorphisms or SNPs. These 11,000 changes each alters the amino acid that is specified in a protein. So with that background, I'd like to turn back to our HTML and continue on our introduction. As we say that DNA sequencing is revolutionizing biology, we're going to introduce this. There are many, many workflows which um, allow us to determine what variation exists. And while we go through a workflow here, it'll be very general and it'll be possible to apply it to hundreds of different applications, whether it's ChIP-seq or even RNA-seq, or different ways of looking at targeted sequencing, exome sequencing, or whole genome sequencing. Our goals are find samples of interest. We'll learn that this is quite easy. Find a reference genome. Again, this is straightforward. We may sometimes take a reference chromosome 
such as chromosome 20 because it's convenient how small it is. In one scenario, workflow one, we'll take a look at sequence reads that have already been aligned to the genome and call our variants. In our second workflow, we'll do something more complicated and go through a series of steps that leads us to the same result, finding variants by doing the mapping and the, the alignment ourselves, and then the variant calling. In the end, we want to also interpret the significance of the variants that we find. Many people have enjoyed using Galaxy, and I'd like to make a comment about that. I think Galaxy is wonderful. It has these advantages. It's web accessible, easy to use. It offers hundreds of software tools, and it's a great way to get oriented towards what kinds of next generation sequencing tools are available. Also, as we go to the Galaxy website, we can see that it has these three panels, tools, it has a display panel, and it has a history panel. As you make uh, different commands in Galaxy, it creates a workflow that you can save and share with others, and so it fosters reproducible research. This is the website, usegalaxy.org. And so while Galaxy is wonderful, I'd like to suggest that perhaps 99% of people doing next generation sequence analysis instead use Unix-like systems. That means Linux or Mac OS X on the command line. Why? Because Linux is even more powerful, it's very adept at handling large data sets, even if a file has millions of rows or gigabytes in size. The workflows here are also reproducible. Once you learn how to install packages yourself, it turns out to be quite straightforward. You can download dozens of packages very easily. Many software tools have a lot of command line options. These are called arguments. And if you have command line software, you can choose which arguments to use and really customize your analysis workflow. Let's go on to the next topic, which is choosing your computer. Now here, there are three main kinds of operating system. Mac OS X, I'm preparing this workshop on a MacBook Air. And so this is very convenient and you can use the terminal which provides a Unix-like environment. Let's take a pause right here and let me show you that in case you've never used the terminal. We can go to Finder, and under Finder, we can look for Applications, and then scroll down to Utilities. Here, we can find Terminal as an example of Utility, and then if, as we click and open it, we're now on the command line in a Unix-like environment, and here you can do many things. And we'll discuss them in this workshop, and I'm assuming that you don't have experience doing this before. So that's Mac OS X. Linux is wonderful, and most of the software that we use was designed specifically to be used on the Linux platform. And so, if possible, go find a Linux computer and work on it. A third option is Windows, and if you're working on a PC, much of the software was not designed for the PC. It's not really been demonstrated that it performs well on the PC and it's often suggested that you don't work on it. There are always exceptions. Many people do write software packages which are useful for Mac, Linux, or Windows. However, for much of what we do, it simply won't work. So one of your options is to install Wubby, and another is to install Sigwin, C-Y-G-W-I-N, and these are tools which allow you to emulate a Unix-like environment on your PC. They're okay, but in my opinion, they won't be strong enough to really run all the analyses we want to run. You can give it a try. Another great option is to use cloud computing. Cloud computing refers to having a server that a company offers you access to. You pay based on how much data you transfer to the cloud and how much compute power you need on the cloud. And examples are Amazon Web Services or Google or Microsoft. If you use a cloud computing solution, we can find separate documentation to do that then you have access on your Windows machine to a Linux environment that's bioinformatics friendly. So this is a really good solution if that's your situation. We're going to create a set of directories. You can choose whichever file names you would like. I'm going to give you some suggestions. One thing we'll need to do is make some directories. Then we're going to fill them with things. And right now I'll take you to my terminal and I'll size it a little bit bigger. And then I'll go ahead and type ls and that's to list the files that are present. I'll go ahead and type clear because we don't need to look at the details of those. And I'll say that I have a home. I can find that home by looking at my PWD, present working directory, and that's users pevsner in my case. I can make a new directory such as ncbi now. By some conventions, if you have two words in a title, 
capitalize one of the letters to make it easier to read it. And then I can go CD into NCVI now. And so CD is to change directories. And suppose you've never done this before. It turns out there are lots of places to get help to learn several dozen of the really basic Linux commands that are useful on the Mac terminal in this case or in the Linux operating system. So how do you get information? Let's try, for example, um, man for manual, mkdir, and a page opens up telling us mkdir is used to make a directory, and it tells us something about the optional arguments you can use. You can do man cd to find out what does it mean to change directories and what kind of options are there. And as I hit the space bar, I can scroll down further in this to get more information. You can move around in Linux within a document by hitting lowercase g to go to the top, capital G to go to the bottom. In this case, I'll go Q to quit. Once I've created my new directory, which is called um, NCBI now, and I've gone into it, LS will tell me what's in it, and at the moment there's nothing. So let's see what we're going to do. We're going to, we're in a NCBI now directory. We might want to have a few different kinds of folders in it. One to store raw data, reference data, analyses, or perhaps SRA GATK. And so let's go ahead here and go make directory in here, and it will be called analyses, make directory raw data, make directory reference sequences, and you can name these however you'd like. And then maybe we'll do one more directory for um, the NCBI tool that is SRA GATK. And so now if I do ls, I can see that there are four different folders in here. One of the options for ls is to say I'd like to list the long version of this. I've done that now. And the other option is to do the long version in a more human readable fashion so that if they're very large file sizes, they'll be easier to read. What I can see is a structure here that when there's the letter D, that indicates that there's a directory. And when I do the letters RWX, that refers to readable, writable, and executable. And this is present for three different groups, the user, the group of people who you're part of, and others. And so this tells you about the permissions, what kind of file this is and what can be done with it. What we've done so far is just make some directories we can use to put things. We can also make additional directories to put software. And you can organize your programs and your directories different ways. And one way is to make a, a large directory called programs and inside of that, put a lot of different software tools. And that's a very nice option. And then you'll be keeping things organized in a good way. Let's talk about workflows. The idea is that we have an ultimate goal. For example, catalog the variation in a genome or a set of genomes and a set of steps we use to reach the goal. Each step is accomplished with one or more software packages and the workflow defines all those steps. For each step, there may be dozens of packages that are available each of which has a large number of parameters that we may choose. So with this, I'd like to begin with the question, how do you choose a workflow? Well, as a community, we study the performance of each step and we ask for each tool, how does it do in terms of error rates? Any algorithm can produce true positives or false positives, true negatives or false negatives. If you consider these outcomes, you can measure sensitivity and specificity. And this is always evaluated relative to some gold standard of the truth of what the answer is as a benchmark. The community often uses the genome of one individual, NA12878, to serve as that gold, gold standard, and we'll introduce that individual soon. And so for a given workflow, best practices are developed, and we can try to follow those. And of course, the na nature of the question you're asking may determine which workflow is best for you. We'll describe two. In the first one, we'll use a brand new NCBI tool to run the popular Genome Analysis Toolkit, or GATK, software package natively. What this means is we'll just have to choose a data set of interest. We'll use something called an SRR data set, and I'll define that, consisting of a line reads. And then with a single command line entry, we'll be able to call variants and produce a variant call format, or VCF file. This is a text file that summarizes variation that's been found. And this will be um, what we'll do in this particular portion of the workshop. The significance is that once you have aligned reads, you can use GATK natively. It is really easy to do this, and we can go from a query of interest 
right to finding variants. And this is great, and an advantage is that we don't need to transfer big data sets to our local machine. In our next portion of the workshop, we'll do something more difficult, which is kind of the main approach that the community takes, using workflow to take sequence reads, these are in the FASTQ format that we'll define, align them to a reference genome using software such as BWA, manipulate the output file, and that's called a SAM file that we compress. We do different operations on it, such as marking PCR duplicates, indexing alignments. Then we call variants, and we'll use a variant caller called FreeBase, which is relatively very straightforward to use. And then for workflow one, one or two, we interpret the variants that are in the file. The significance of this second approach is that you may need to do alignment yourself. You can choose many different software packages that are available, BWA or others, and then you can employ any number of variant callers to call variation. Workflow 2 will go through this in detail. So let's go now to one of the basic things we need to know how to do, and that's to download, compile, and install various software tools. It can take some time to do that, but once you learn how, you can do many of them really easily. Here are some ideas before we get started. It's a series of concepts or suggestions I'd like to make. First off, all these tools are freely available, although in some cases, such as GATK, you may need a license for commercial use. You can access these simply by going to a website, and I give websites below for particular tools, and then you can go with a command like wget, for example, on Linux or curl on a Mac to download, the, download files on the command line, or you can, if you'd like, install and run brew.sh, you can use a Git repository to go to GitHub, a major repository of software tools. You can also download from a website, and on a Mac, the software is downloaded to your downloads directory. From there, you can move it around, unpack it, and use it as needed. There is a Linux philosophy, and this philosophy is that each tool we use should be designed to accomplish one task, and it should do that very well. It should be modular so that we can connect different tools together. For example, you can take a data set, run one tool, and pipe or send the output of the first uh, software package to another software and do another operation. The part of the philosophy says that the software should be robust in what it does and very clear. It should use shell scripts, and we will demonstrate that as we're on the command line. And I would recommend you look at the Wikipedia article that I've linked here for more information. Next, when you download software, it's often compressed. That saves room. It may be that you have some file .tar.gz, .gzip, .bzip2, and you'll need to uncompress it. You can do this really easily with a command, and then you may also need to compile the software with something like make or cmake and install it, for example, by using make install. When you encounter some problem when, and you need help, try a search with your favorite browser, such as Google, for example, for the terms Linux unpack tar. And if we just stop over here, to a web browser and we type that Linux or you could do Mac command line unpack tar you'll find that thousands of other people had the same question and you come to learn which websites you prefer to look to go get help and that in these websites they'll give simple explanations for Mac users for example of how to unpack a, a file so you can get help you also can get help by typing man for different commands like man make now, once you've installed a package, you can often find it's executable in a folder called bin, where that stands for binary or binaries. And if you type the name of a package, you may go from your home and your username to a folder you've created where you've put a particular software package, and then you find a bin directory. And there you can see um, that if you type the name of the executable, SAM tools, for example, you get a list of the basic usage. Let's go just do this over here. I'm clearing, and then I'm typing SAM tools. In my case, I've added SAM tools to my path, so I don't need to specify exactly where the executable is located. And I can see basic information about the usage and about the different commands that I can use. And so it is, for example, with the NCBI tool, fastq dump. I can get information on the usage and the options that are available. In this case, it's pointing me to say, use option dash dash help for more information. So next, the executable is the program that runs, 
you can identify it in a particular directory by typing ls-l, that means the long version, to see permissions and to see the nature of the particular files, whether you have, um, for example, an executable or not. And so here's an example that I've highlighted. You can go CD or change directory to your programs, SAM tools, and go into a SAM tools directory. And there you can type ls to see the contents or ls-l for the long version. And you can see that this is an X because it's an executable. You can also see the size of the file information, such as the date that it was obtained. Um, the first character on this line indicates that this is a file. That's the dash. This would be a D if this were a directory. The next three symbols are RWX for read, write, and execute. And this applies to the user, the group, and other. So we can use SAM tools by specifying the path all the way there. Or as I mentioned, we can just type SAM tools, SAM tools if we've added that particular executable into our path. How do we do that? Well, you can, for example, go to your home directory and type ls-a to see everything. And here I will go cd to home, and I will do ls-a. And there are many files here which are um, starting with a dot. These are files which you don't see if you just type ls alone. And they're hidden in that way. And this includes, for example, a bash profile and a bash rc and different files that contain executables that tell the computer whichever directory you're working in, wherever you are on your computer on the command line, you can access that executable. And so this is called using path, and that you can export the path to try to um, define where your folder is, and also you can put the executables there. If you'd like more information about this, you can go to a website at Stack Exchange that I've linked here, in which a user asks how this works, and there's a very nice explanation to help you put things into path. Now, you can also get, in, get guidance on how to install various packages from the people at GATK, and the GATK forums website includes ways to install different packages as well. There are lots of places to get help. For those using a Mac OS, it turns out that you might need to use Xcode, and that's something that you can download from the store, from the Apple Store, and you also may need to install GCC, something that's available on the Linux system typically, but not on Macs in general, and so you might need to install that sort of thing. These are problems you need to learn how to solve. Next, in this document, I've listed a whole group of software packages. Get BWA, we can use that in Workflow 2 for alignment. FastQC to assess the quality of different FastQ files. And so for each of them, I've tried to include relevant publications when they're present. I've included key websites to go for the download page or for a getting started guide and for help. And then I've included some notes showing how you might go to the program, move it from downloads into your present directory. This is what the dot means. We're moving from the home downloads, a particular thing that we downloaded off of a website, to the present directory, which is under our programs folder. Unzip, in this case with the bunzip2 command for a bz2 file, and then a tar command with additional arguments so that we can go prepare um, BWA for use. And so I've given you some guidance here as well. And if you go to the key website for that particular software, you'll be able to get help as well. Here are more examples of software we might be interested in. FastQC, Freebase for variant calling, GATK, which is very popular, Picard is another one, SAM Blaster, SAM Tools. You might say this is a lot of software, and it is. On the other hand, this is what we need to manipulate sequence data going through a long workflow. Our first simpler workflow is really not asking so much. For that, we can use um, SRA, or Sequence Read Archive Toolkit, and something that's brand new, the SRA GATK. So let me give you an example of how you might install SRA Toolkit on a Mac environment. What we can do is go to a website. We can look for NCBI, and we can type, um, you, could, you could do this from a Google search as well, but you can say I'd like to go to the SRA database. This is the sequence read archive. And we search. As we go to that database under tools and software, download the toolkit. You can go click Mac OS in my case, or Windows, or different Linux flavors. So you can download the software that easily. And then you can go to toolkit documentation. And this tells you um, here 
a toolkit installation configuration guide tells you carefully what to do, you simply download as we've done. You can use wget directly if you'd like to, or curl on a Mac. Instead of clicking the download button, you unpack, and in that case for Linux, you can use the tar-xzf and then the name of the packed file, and then you'll be able to unpack it. On Mac, you could double click on the downloaded file, or working on the command line, you could use a tar command. Windows also has instructions here, and in that way, you can download it, and then once you add the executables to your path, you can just type, for example, fastq dump from anywhere and, and see it work. We've already done that here. I type fastq dump, and I have access to the toolkit. Then you can test the toolkit configuration, and one thing that NCBI recommends is that you configure this so that you do not have local caching, and that will um, help ensure that you don't fill up your local hard drive with too many files that are very large. So here, if I do VDB config space dash I, I can go ahead and get a configuration menu, and this would let me change different options like caching and quit Q to leave when we're done. If you'd like more information about this, then I'd like to recommend that you use a wonderful tutorial that is um, available. Go back to the HTML. A wonderful tutorial that's available as a webinar on the NCBI website that I've linked here. And this explains how to download and use the SRA toolkit in more detail. The one that's brand new, that's just been introduced, you also can download and um, you can see a readme with some basic instructions, and the key command we're going to use is a Java command. And you can also see, as you go here, um, grch37.tar. This refers to a version of the human genome reference. And sragatkpackage.tar is a set of utilities that we can use to do our analysis of aligned reads. So let's just take a look here. CD home. And when we're here, we can go to a folder called My Projects and look in it. And we have NCBI Now. And then you have, for example, the SRA GATK here. At this moment, we haven't added anything into that. If you go instead to CD Home My Programs and look, Here's the SRA toolkit. In that, we have the tar file that we've downloaded, and then you can have the one that's been unpacked. You can CD into that and look, and you have a README. We can do less README to get information about that particular package. And then you can also do README of the other, or three Readmes and all. You can take a look, for example, in the bin file. You can do um, CD to go there or just LS bin. And it shows you many different utilities that are present. I'll take you over now to take a look at um, my home, my programs. And these are various programs that I've installed. We'll CD here into NCBI. Excuse me, we'll go here into SRA, GATK, which is a folder I've created, LS. And this is the download um, from the website that has the new software package of interest. So that's getting SRA GATK, and that website includes directions. You can go ahead and unpack it, for example, with the tar command. What does it look like inside of here? Let's take a quick look at, for example, this folder that says GRCH37. If we CD GRCH37 and look inside, we can see a FASTA file. LS-LH tells me the size of it is 2.9 gigabytes, as shown on the second line. And we can do a head of that file. And it happens to be ends. We can do a tail of that file. That shows the sequence at the very end. The beginning probably has ends because it's repetitive DNA. And you can do less even if you'd like to look at the um, details of the file and scroll through it. And so as we hit the space bar, we come to the sequence data that's in there. And this is many millions of rows. You can count them with word count dash L for lines of grch37.fasta. This should take a little time. 
because there are millions of rows in a typical reference file. But that's what we have. And in this case, it appears that there are 44 million rows of data in this particular reference file. Now we are at step five. We're ready to get some sequence data. We want to find some samples of interest at NCBI and what's called SRR run accessions. We'll begin with a practical example of NA12878. This is an individual whose genome has been extensively characterized. NA refers to the genomic DNA, while GM12878 refers to the cell line that you can obtain from Coriel, C-O-R-I-E-L-L. -L. That's the cell culture repository in New Jersey. NA12878 is part of a Ceph pedigree that's very well characterized, and you can see the whole genome sequence reads, for example, at the Illumina Platinum Genomes Project that I give the link to. We'll do this live. Let's take a look at the NCBI website. We'll enter the search term NA12878 and look for the different entries we can find. And so here we are. We do the search in the 40 or so entree databases. There are many different entries that are available. We'll focus on the ones here under genomes. The bio project is very useful to look at to get an overview. Bio samples also are very useful. Database of variation has many entries. Nucleotide, we're going to go to SRA, where there's 695 entries. On the left sidebar, we can specify that we want to look at the genome or the exome. In our case, the genome is fine. And for the purpose of our workflow, we have to have aligned data. And so many of the data sets are not aligned, and we're going to restrict our search there again, just by clicking on the left sidebar. The individual entries here are particular SRX or run accessions. And so let me take a moment and tell you about those. SRA, the sequence read archive, has an accession number. This is a virtual holder with SRA. SRP has the project metadata. SRX is an experiment accession. SRS is, an, is a sample accession describing the physical sample. We don't really use SRZ. And what we're looking for today, SRR, is an SRA run accession with an information such as this one here that we can use. Let's go back to that website. There are individual experiments. What we're going to do to zoom in further is go send to the run selector. And at the run selector, we click go. This is a really great utility that shows you on the left side a series of facets or ways you can limit your search by some feature of interest. Have a look and explore these. And for example, you can pick the platform and say, we'd like to look at Illumina data. And it's that simple to restrict your search. And then you can say, in our particular case, while there are hundreds of runs, we want them of a certain size. And so we can look at megabytes or megabases. And here, if we have entries that are more than, say, 0 to 50, uh, 50,000 megabytes, this is the same as 50 gigabytes we can take entries which are relatively bigger, and in them, the SRR is the run accession. We can very conveniently select the ones we're interested in and download the accession list to whatever has been accepted, uh, selected, and so you have access easily to the SRR run accessions. Then to the run selector, um, if you want to, you can click on these and look further at what that run accession looks like as it's hyperlinked, and it shows you the sequence read archive this particular entry with information about how many bases were sequenced, the size of the file, the date, and links to much further information, including the uh, study number. And this is part of Genome in a Bottle, which is the project to deeply characterize NA12878 and some related genomes. So getting that is really easy, and with that, we're ready for our main workflow. We'll end this session by calling variants and we'll do it with SRAGATK. This is really fast and easy. And here we are. We choose our aligned reads for NA12878. We can do that right from the NCBI website. And in our case, we can go ahead and use SRR835775. This is a nice sized file. We don't have to download it. All we have to do is point to it. Navigate to your directory that contains SRAGATK. And then run the following command. I'll copy it right now. You can do this too off of the HTML if you would like. And we're going to look at a region of chromosome 20, which includes a particular gene, GATA5. And we'll go ahead and start running the command. This is a Java command, dash CP, and it calls an SRA GATK package. It points to the Broad Institute, 
and I'll start by hitting enter. And so it will begin doing the analysis. As it starts, it'll take about a minute or two. I'll explain what's going on a little bit. The java-cp command specifies that we're going to look for a path of directories below where we are now that has all the zip and jar files that are executed. So this is very convenient. That's what the Java CP does, as it calls different utilities that we need to use. We point to the Broad Institute where the GATK engine is running, and there we call a program called the Unified Genotyper. We specify an input, which in this case is SRR835775. I would suggest you try a different SRR as well, and just try it out and see how it works. We point to a reference genome, which is in the FASTA format, and this is the human genome reference grch37.fa for FASTA. We next indicate that we're looking at chromosome 20. You could switch this to chromosome 1 if you want, in a very particular region that's not too big. That's why this run is already completed as I look over at my command line. And then we specify the name of the output file. Some notes. The Java CP specifies the path. If you would like, you can try to specify any different chromosome and look for variants in any region of interest. And as an example, if you wanted to switch to chromosome 1, just be sure to include the version number. What that means is NC underscore five zeros and a one refers to a RefSeq accession for human chromosome 1. The dot 10 refers to a version number, and if you omit that, this won't work. What's the difference between different version numbers? Something in the DNA sequence has been updated with each subsequent version. And you can find a list of these human genome references if you go to NCBI, go to the assembly database, select human, and write on the human page. In fact, we'll take just one moment and do that. We go to NCBI, we go to assembly, we search human, the very first entry is GRCH38 in this case, a slightly different genome build. And on this page, if we scroll down, we can get the accessions of all the different human chromosomes. So that's really not too hard to do. You can try a different SRR. You can specify any output name. In our case, we said chromosome 20, the name of the SRR.VCF for variant call format. What came across the screen was various information, and here's our output. It's a VCF file. It's actually my favorite file type. It summarizes everything that is the identified variation within a series of reads or inside of a genome, and it tells us what's unique or special about every genome that we're analyzing. So here we go ls, and we can say that there's a new VCF file in there, and we can do word count of the VCF and see it has 460 lines. We can do less, and we can see that this has a series of headers, header and header lines with two hash marks that tell us information about what's in this file. When we get to the point of having a single hash mark, as shown here, we have the chromosome position and identifier, the reference and alternate read. For example, at one given position, that reference is a C and the alternate is a T. And that's the change that's happened in this person at that position. Now, you may have hundreds of, refer of variants here, you may have millions of variants in a whole genome, and the idea is you can look through those and ask which of them might be deleterious rather than neutral, which might introduce a stop codon or be previously associated with disease, and so you can study that variation from the, G from the VCF file really easily. So the next thing we'll do is to make a pileup. I'm going to again copy this command, and I will just demonstrate what the pileup looks like. I hit Q to leave my VCF behind. I clear paste, and go. The idea of the pileup is that I can again specify the same kind of information, and then I can say I would like to know in this range what the output looks like, and I'll give you a preview of it. What are the reads, one base at a time, across the physical map of the chromosome? And that here, in one position, we have a string of Gs. The next position, we have a string of Gs with an occasional CT and a C it thrown in. And then we have a position which is largely A's and C's, so it's very likely a heterozygous or SNP variant position. Then we go back to near perfect and perfect calls um, at the next positions. So one thing you can do is ask, what is the evidence in favor of a particular variant? And you can look at it through the pileup. The other thing you can do is say, what about um, the read depth? And you can see that there may be 
let's suppose there are about 45 reads at a given chromosomal position here that are all G. Sometimes there are fewer reads. Why might that be? Well, maybe it's a highly repetitive region and it's hard to sequence across it and it's hard to make the calls very well. And perhaps um, there are other regions where you have very high depth. In this case, the depth is 71, far above the average. And why might that happen? Perhaps this is a repetitive region and you're really looking at reads from two different loci in the genome. That would be a kind of an artifact. Or it could just be that this was a particularly easy re region uh, to look at, um, to sequence. And so here we have a pileup file that's appeared, and we can do less chromosome 20 pileup. And as we do that, I can just expand the monitor a bit. And I'm hitting the space bar now to see the read depth as we scroll down. That sometimes is a bit bigger, sometimes is a bit smaller, but the pileup is wonderful to let us take a look at any particular position of interest and study it in more detail. Okay, that's it for today. And on the next module, we're going to do another workflow, which is a bit more work, but will also accomplish this great task. We start with any raw sequence reads, we align them to a genome, we call the variants, and we produce this VCF file. And in many cases, we don't already have aligned reads available. Maybe it's a genome that we've sequenced ourselves and we got the raw data. So what we do next will be a longer version of the same task, but it's really great to be able to look into what's inside of a human genome.